Samuel Huntington is a world famous political scientist, mainly for his uh, book, Clash of Civilizations, in the 1990s, in which he argued that in the future, geopolitical struggles will not be between ideologies like communism and liberalism, but will be between religions, ethnic identities, cultures, whole civilizations. He was absolutely right. He also wrote a book in 2004 titled, Who Are We? Challenges to America's National Identity. He argued that from the 1960s on, the central government has followed policies that are destroying American national identity. Unless there is a vigorous reversal of policy, he says, or unless there is a long protracted war, American national identity will disintegrate. But the America he is talking about does not go back to 1776. The America he is talking about is no older than 1865. I shall symbolize these alternative Americas as Jeffersonian and Lincolnian. The Jeffersonian style flourished from 1776 to 1861 when it was violently displaced by what I'll call Lincolnian Americanism, which began to fracture in the 60s. Today, this Lincolnian Americanism is coming apart, having unwittingly paved the way for cultural Marxism uh, and the Marxist vision of America. To co complicate the matter, Jeffersonian Americanism, long thought to have been safely confined to the dustbin of history, has reappeared. And what follows, I show that Confederate monuments are <coughs> caught in a culture war between the disintegrating Lincolnian view, vision, the cultural Marxist challenge to a new kind of America, and a revived Jeffersonian Americanism. That's the culture war we're in. Now let's begin by asking, what does it mean to be an American? Well, if anyone is an American, Jefferson is. And if anyone is an American, Lincoln is. But their views of the Constitution, of republicanism, of political economy, are worlds apart. And so are we. For the Jeffersonian, the states are sovereign political societies, and the Constitution is a compact between those societies, creating a central government to which the states delegated only a few enumerated powers, sort of like the EU. From this it follows that a state may lawfully nullify an intrusion by the central government into its reserve powers, and it may lawfully secede from the compact. Now the Lincolnians flatly deny all of this. The states, they say, are not, and never were, sovereign political societies. The American people in the mass are sovereign as a nation. Lincoln said the states did not create the union, the union created the states, and he compared them to counties. Now, if this is true, then state nullification and secession are lawfully ruled out absolutely. Both Jefferson and Lincoln were leaders of political parties identified as Republican, but their views of Republicanism, again, were worlds apart. Jeffersonians accepted the classical Republican teaching, and I'll make a lot of this, that republics should be small. And you can think of Kirk's talk earlier. If a larger polity is needed, as it usually is, it should be in some way a federation of small republics with the right of secession or nullification. For the Lincolnians, however, there is no limit to the size of a republic, no limit. And once a state enters, it cannot, on its own authority, leave. So the Lincolnians erect a kind of invisible Berlin wall around the states to prevent secession. Now the same incompatibility appears in their views of political economy. For the Jeffersonians, the rules should be rigged to favor a wide distribution of private property in local, state, and regional economies. The Lincolnians, in contrast, favor national, financial, and economic centralization. This is accomplished by favoring some businesses over others and by creating a public debt, which Hamilton said was a public blessing. 
The Jeffersonians bitterly described this policy as corruption. Today we call it crony capitalism or rent seeking. Now, considering these two Americas, what was America like when the Jeffersonians ruled it? First of all, Southerners were its main leaders. This is something we tend to forget. They led in winning the secession war with Britain. It wasn't a revolution, it was a secession war. And in forming the Constitution. And later, in the first 72 years after ratification, only five presidents were elected from the North. Only five. Five Southern presidents served two terms, but no Northern president served two terms. Similar ratios held for other high federal offices as Speaker of the House, Attorney General, and Supreme Court Justices. All the territory beyond the 13 states were acquired by Southern administrations. And the South led in higher education had the highest per capita wealth uh, in the country in 1860. And as of 1860, the South sent nearly three times as many of its young people to college as did the North. And the first college in the world chartered to give women advanced degrees was Wesleyan College in Macon, Georgia, 1836. Jefferson's election was called the Revolution of 1800. The revolution was on behalf of state sovereignty and against crony capitalism. The Jeffersonians were obsessed with crony capitalism, as we all should be. Jefferson abolished all inland federal taxes. <laughs> and in 1833, the Jeffersonians paid off the national debt. Whereas Europeans were loaded with taxes, dead, and feared the king's large standing army, Americans in 1860 had hardly any national debt. And the states were also frugal in taxes and debt. And the sword was in the hands of state militias, not the central government. The citizens in Jeffersonian America under Southern leadership enjoyed more political and individual liberty than any people in the world, then or since. Let that soak in if it's true, and I think it is. By 1860, its wealth was greater than any country in the world except Britain, and it was more evenly distributed. Its literacy rate was the highest in the world. And Jeffersonians were serious about the classical Republican teaching that republics should be small. Virginia had conquered the vast Northwest Territory Today, the states of Illinois, Ohio, Wisconsin, Indiana, parts of Michigan, and Minnesota. That belonged to Virginia. Virginians told themselves that they could not both enjoy Republican life and control territory of that vast size. It would become an empire. So they gave it away. Lead us not into temptation. <laughs> They gave it to the Confederation to enable new republics to be formed through secession of the people. By this principle, states also could divide through secession when they became too large in population for self-government. So the western counties of Virginia seceded and formed the state of Kentucky. Tennessee seceded from North Carolina. Maine seceded from Massachusetts. And so it went. But Jefferson went further. For 2,000 years, republics seldom went beyond 300,000 in population. That gives you what they, an idea of what they meant by small. So Jefferson argued that Virginia should be divided into small ward republics, each having considerable sovereignty over local matters. So that, that was Jeffersonian America. Now, what would this Jeffersonian America have been like had it stayed within the boundaries of the original 13 states? Because we're talking about size. With expanding population and repeated secessions, 
There might be 50 states as we have today. Each state on average will be about the size of Switzerland. And if Jefferson had his way, would be further divided into ward republics, which resemble the Swiss cantons. Now Switzerland has 26 little states, and they're sovereign states. The smallest is 15,000 people. And they have uh, one that's over a million. The average is 300,000 people. So that's what Jefferson America, I mean, Virginia would kind of look like Switzerland. And each Swiss state has its own militia. But this process was disrupted by the Louisiana Purchase Territory, which doubled the size of the Union. Oh, God. <laughs> Got a problem now. New Englanders immediately threatened secession, fearing Virginia, a Virginia-dominated empire. They said Virginia intends to be the Austria of America. Jefferson agreed there would be an empire, but argued that it need not be centralized. He called it a, quote, empire of liberty. What is that? Well, it's an empire of liberty because the states would retain the right of secession. If it got too large and unwieldy for self-government, new states or unions of states could be formed by secession. Many Jeffersonians thought America would naturally divide through secession into three federations. One federation along the Atlantic, another along the Mississippi, and a third along the Pacific. This was a very generally understood speculation. So in 1861, when 11 American states did in fact secede and form a federation of their own, they were simply doing what was lawful in Jeffersonian America. Northern President James Buchanan and his Northern Attorney General agreed that the central government had no authority to use military force to coerce a sovereign state back into the Union. They were both Jeffersonian Americans, those Northerners that voted Southerners into office. Lincoln also believed in an empire, but it was to be a centralized empire. He did the math, and he saw that by 1930, the U.S. would likely surpass Europe in population and could become the dominant power in the world. And he offered that as a reason for making war on the southern states. Now, historians acknowledge that Lincoln's Republican Party was a revolutionary party intent on destroying the South politically and, and remaking America into a regime of economic nationalism controlled by the emerging New York-Chicago industrial axis. Instead of fighting crony capitalism, Lincolnian America would openly embrace it as a public virtue. It would be crony capitalism on stilts. That was supposed to be a joke, but anyway. <laughs> But there was a problem. This was to be a centralized national regime. But Jeffersonian America was not a nation, just like the European Union is not a nation. It's a federation. It was a compact between sovereign states. So this Lincolnian nation had to be created out of scratch. And the template the North used was provided by New England. Now, one cannot exaggerate the conviction that uh, New Englanders had of their right to rule the continent. To give you just one example, um, for instance, Ralph Waldo Emerson justified confiscating Southern property at the end of the war and ridding the region of Southerners. By doing so, he said, quote, you at once open the whole South to the enterprise and genius of new men of all nations, and you extend New England from Canada to the Gulf to the Pacific. America was to be New England writ large, complete with a Puritan Thanksgiving. 
But it was found impossible to read the South out of American history. It was too deeply established. I mean, the, I mean Jeffersonian Americanism was America. This new thing was just starting. So it's going to be difficult. A few decades after the war, when passions had cooled, many Northerners who had been Jeffersonian Americans were half ashamed of their victory and began to appreciate the conservative virtues of the Old South, which were in sharp contrast to the socially chaotic North going through the Industrial Revolution. Uh, uh, European states went through that chaos too, England. And it was going through it, where money making had become a religion. And you really can't exaggerate that in the 19th century. Money making did, in that region, really had become a religion, including a theology. Richard Weaver called the Old South, quote, the last non-materialistic civilization in the West, end quote. Grover Cleveland, a northern Jeffersonian American, ordered that captured Confederate flags be returned to southern states. Union veterans shook hands for the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg in 1913. Congress. Congress would eventually declare Confederate veterans to be American veterans. The Jeffersonian Memorial was initially resisted by Lincolnian Americans because it seemed to legitimate the Confederacy as part of America. Now, Southerners agreed to drop secession as a constitutional right. Okay, we'll just drop that if given national respect for their heroes and identity. That was the deal. And respect was given. General Grant's son organized a military funeral in New York City for Verena Davis, the Confederate president's wife. The only time a military funeral has been given for a woman. And Dr. Kogan told us about the uh, happy times in New York they, that the Confederates had with Union um, sons of the Union um, war, uh, Army. So the Southerners were beginning to be accepted. Lincoln, in a speech given shortly after Lee surrendered, asked the band to play Dixie. He said it was a song he'd always liked, and now that the South was back in the Union, it could be claimed by North and South. It was an American song. In other words, we have a union now of Jeffersonian Americanism and Lincolnian Americanism. It's, it's an unstable compound, <laughs> but that's what they did. That's the new nation. And it was owned by North and South. 78 years after Lincoln said that, in 1943, a film was made titled Dixie. It told the story of the song's origin and starred Bing Crosby and Dorothy L'Amour. The advertisement described Dixie as, quote, a rousing song that expresses the spirit of America, end quote. <laughs> now, what was the spirit of America that Dixie <clears throat> expresses? It is not the morbid spirit of killing people in the name of the Lord. That is the spirit of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. <laughs> it is the joyous spirit of Jeffersonian self-government at a human scale. It is the same spirit expressed in the don't tread on me, you know, the yellow flag with the rattlesnake flag designed by Christopher Gadsden here in Charleston, South Carolina. The Gadsden flag, by the way, was America's first flag flown by the Continental Congress before the Stars and Stripes were ever designed. It's popular with the Tea Party movement. Jeffersonian America. Up to the 18, 1970s, Hollywood made many films extolling Southern virtues and using Southern characters to express American virtues. You want to know what an American is? Well, look at this Southern family. Gone with the Wind, is still, by some estimates, the greatest box office hit in history when adjusted for inflation. 
Lincolnian America needed the South and was enriched by it. But the South needed Lincolnian America, which protected its honor in the new nation. But by the 1960s, serious fractured, fractures appeared, which marked the beginning of Lincolnian America's slow disintegration. The attack on Confederate monuments is in part, is part of that disintegration. Now, how did that happen? Well, what, what was wrong with Lincolnian Americanism? Lincolnian nationalism had two components which are incompatible, an ideology and a culture. The ideology appears in the Gettysburg Address where Lincoln defines America in a way no one had before. He defines it as an idea. The idea that all men are created equal, from which, it follow, from which follows a set of natural rights. The second element was a culture that all Americans supposedly shared. I, I'm not sure they did share it, but there has to be this ideology of a nation. Now, there's some reason for this, to, to, to say there was such a culture, and it, it, it goes this way. America was born during the religious wars between Protestants and Catholics, that's true. And, and America was founded as a Protestant country, and that's true. Just as Israel was founded as a Jewish country. There are, are non-Jews in Israel, but it's a Jewish country. And Pakistan is an Islamic country. 98% of the signers of the Constitution were Protestants. The northern style of Protestantism in its New England idiom was used to define the new Lincolnian nation. Now, southern Protestantism is a different thing. It's similar, but it's different. But it was a northern Protestantism that dominated. I don't endorse this nationalism we're going to describe, but I just want to try to give an accurate description of it. Its main features were this. What unified it was the English language, Christianity, British conceptions of law and liberty, an ethic of dissent to religious and political authoritarianism, an ethic of commercialism, personal responsibility, hard work, public education, and what historians call the American creed. The creed is that America is a nation favored by God and has a mission to improve the world. But this union of egalitarian ideology with a religious culture would eventually fail. The reason is this. Ideology claims to embody self-evident universal truths free of the one-sided particularisms of religious tradition. Religious tradition is based not on secular natural reason, but on faith in a revelation from God. So the secular ideology and the religious tradition are in conflict. Now this conflict was not initially noticed because Protestant individualism overlaps so closely with the secular ideology of natural rights. They're very similar. But as Protestant elites gradually lost their faith in revealed truth, they became more liberal until finally secular natural rights ideology became the very definition of American national identity. And that was a big change. By mid, okay, let us call those who favored the secular ideological part of the American creed left-wing Lincolnians. And those who favored the Anglo-Protestant cultural part of the creed as right-wing Lincolnians. Now, you didn't have to be a confessing Protestant to be a right-wing Lincolnian, but you had to um, uh, respect the Protestant traditions and the style of life. You had to assimilate. Now, by mid-20th century, it was clear that the left-wing Lincolnians had triumphed. Richard Hofstadter could famously say, quote, it has been our fate as a nation not to have ideologies, but to be one, to be an ideology. In this view, to be an American, all that is necessary is to subscribe 
to a set of abstract propositions about natural rights. But this left-wing Lincolnianism could not long sustain a national identity because natural rights ideology springs from a false conception of rationality. It's a very popular one, but it's false. It imagines that reason is a matter of contemplating self-evident propositions free of the prejudices and one-sidedness of traditions, which can then be applied to reshape society. But this is an illusion. Without a critical engagement with the particularisms of an historic moral tradition, the principles of an ideology are empty and can't guide conduct or they're arbitrary. That's a big question, but let me just give an example to try to make sense of it. Take the inalienable natural rights to life, liberty, and property. Being abstract, they provide no guide to conduct. They cannot tell us, for instance, whether an unborn human being has a right to life. If we say it does, that contradicts the inalienable right a woman has to property in her body. These are her hands, her legs, and so on. And consequently, the liberty she has to abort this part of her body. Natural rights ideology is shot through with such contradictions. And without the guide of an historic moral tradition does not have the resources to resolve them. So the more the country believes in natural rights ideology, the more there'll be a constant low a chronic low-grade civil war going on, no agreement. A country in the crip of an ideological style of politics, as was the Soviet Union, as the United States today, will be constantly racked by the conflicting arbitrary policies of its elites, which are presented as, not as the arbitrary acts they are, but as a neutral rationality fighting prejudice, bigotry, discrimination, intolerance, racism, sexism, homophobia, transgender phobia, and other offenses against an ever receding standard of equality. You can never satisfy it. Even an innocent institution such as marriage is judged oppressive by the Supreme Court because it discriminates against same-sex couples and so violates the equality principle. The incoherencies that arose in Jeffersonian America regarding slavery, constitutional rights, the tariff, and so on, could be resolved rationally only by loyal and skillful participants working critically within the inherited Jeffersonian tradition. Northern presidents such as James Buchanan and his attorney general, in their views of secession, were such participants. Lincoln was not. At no point in his career did Lincoln acknowledge the actual American tradition he had inherited. Instead, he created a fanciful alternative country in which the states are not sovereign, political societies. He said the central government's mission is to shape society in accord with an egalitarian ideology of natural rights whereas the word equality never appears in the Constitution at all, except to affirm the equal sovereignty of the states. That's the only equality you have in the Constitution. The Gettysburg Address has done much to encourage an ideological style of thinking in politics and in education with disastrous results. Let me just qualify here. I don't deny their natural rights. I'm just saying you cannot have abstract natural rights. They have to be filtered through a tradition. And that's going to mean they're going to be, they're going to be seen differently by different traditions. Lincoln was the first left-wing Lincolnian because he gave primacy to natural rights ideology over culture and tradition. Whereas right-wing Lincolnians filtered natural rights ideology through Anglo-Protestant culture. And in order to sustain that culture, they gave careful attention to immigration policy. By the turn of the century, it was thought that a massive influx of immigrants from what was perceived as an alien Eastern Europe threatened the cohesion of Anglo-Protestant culture. 
1924, Congress shut immigration down to a trickle and favored immigrants from Western Europe on the ground that they were the easiest to assimilate. So for 40 years, there was hardly any immigration. Time out. And that allowed assimilation. But by the 1960s, the left Lincolnian doctrine that America is not a culture, but an ideology was in full swing. The Hart Seller Immigration Act of 1965 and acts that followed, plus failure to enforce immigration laws, favored third world immigration, both legal and illegal. And this has led to a spectacular demographic change. In, the 19, in 1960, Lincolnian America, sorry, in 1960, Lincolnian America was 89% European, American-born European stock. Non-white Hispanics made up less than 6 million. Today they number 58 million, 63% of whom are from Mexico. Many are concentrated in Spanish-speaking communities in states bordering Mexico with little interest in assimilation. Revanchist ideas of reclaiming the Southwest territories taken by the Americans in the 19th century are encouraged by Hispanic leaders and even in speeches of Mexican presidents. Miami-Dade County, Florida, has a population close to 3 million, 63% of which speak Spanish on a regular basis. Non-Spanish-speaking Americans cannot find jobs often and are moving north, taking, as they say, the American flag with them. So we, we're having a conflict now about what America is. And there's a serious move to make Spanish the official language of South Florida since most people speak it. Islamic no-go zones, long established in Europe where Sharia law can be uh, practiced uh, outside the state, are appearing in America. Arabic is now an official language in the state of Michigan. English is no longer a bond of national unity as it was for Lincolnian America. Children are taught some 200 languages in Chicago schools. And a similar thing is true of other large urban centers. During the 1960s, left Lincolnianism used the acid of natural rights egalitarian ideology to make Americans feel guilty about privileging Anglo-Protestant culture. Are not all cultures equal? All you need are natural rights, it seemed. Consequently, ease of assimilation is no longer a criterion for vetting immigrants. As Professor Michael Walzer, of Princeton University said, and I quote, assimilation is un-American, end quote. So see, we, we have a different kind of Americanism coming up. The rejection of assimilation opened the door to cultural Marxism. The cultural Marxists placed culture, not timeless natural rights, as the center of political discourse, and pictured America as a struggle between an oppressive Anglo-Protestant majority culture and third world minority cultures. And we, we get there the, the ethic that there's a kind of affirmative action program in immigration policy to bring people from every country of the world, you know, so it will, America will look like the world, really be universal. I date the beginning, and this is just me, I date the beginning of cultural Marxism to 1969 with New York critic Susan Sontag's remark that, quote, the white race is the cancer of human history, end quote. Not long after that, programs called white studies began to appear in elite universities. These teach that America is structurally a white supremacist society all the way down, and that achievements of white people are bought at the expense of people of color. Now, if American society is indeed structurally white supremacist, it cannot be reformed. It must be replaced. This means that the Anglo-Protestant culture, at least as the North understood it, which gave moral substance to Lincolnian America by uniting North and South, must be overthrown in favor of a new multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilinguistic American nation. 
Now, President Clinton endorsed this cultural Marxist view. Speaking to students at Portland State University in 1998, he celebrated the fact that European Americans are on the way to becoming a minority. And they are. Uh, Native-born European Americans, as I said, were 89% of the population in 1960. According to Brookings Institute, they will be under 50% before 2040. And that's a drop of 50% in one lifetime. Clinton acknowledged that no country in history has gone through such a sudden demographic change. But, he says, this massive influx of third world immigration uh, is invigorating America and is, quote, reminding us all of what it really means to be an American, end quote. In other words, the true America is a multicultural nation, not a Lincolnian nation. Now, unless I be accused of racism, and by the way, I'm just trying to look at the northern view of nationalism here, um, let me say that third world people are as beloved of God as the Anglo-Protestant settlers. But why is it a good thing that the descendants of the culture that cleared the forests and built the institutions of a great civilization, why is it good that they should become a minority? Why should their posterity be a minority? That's something to ask yourself. But what really demonstrates the disintegration of Lincolnian American, Americanism is not so much the di diminishing role of Anglo-Protestant culture, I'm just talking about that, but that talk of state secession has again become mainstream. That was not supposed to happen. <laughs> Lincoln fought a war to kill state sovereignty or did not deny it ever existed, and prevent secession. That was also the reason Francis Bellamy gave for placing the words one nation indivisible in his Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. So that was never to come up again. Yet, after Bush defeated Gore in 2000, Democratic pundits began talking about the secession of blue from red states. <clears throat> Polls over the uh, a secession party in Vermont was formed in 2003 and ran candidates in 2010 for governor and state legislature. And it was affirmed and approved by distinguished figures such as John George Kennan, the great George Kennan, John Kenneth Galbraith, and Walter Williams. Polls over the last decade show that 25% of Americans favor secession of their state. That is some 80 million people. For those classes very conservative, it is 37%, and it's higher among millennials than the general public. A recent Reuters poll found that 30% of Californians favor secession. And this month, a bill was introduced in the California legislature to hold a referendum on secession May 4th, 2021. <laughs> but one may ask, what does all this have to do with the attack on Confederate monuments? Simply this, the monuments were erected against the background of a confident Anglo-Protestant Lincolnian nationalism that united North and South as real people. That's hard to do because they're prickly. The South had pledged allegiance to that regime and merely wanted to have a place of honor and respect in it. With the collapse of Lincolnian Anglo-Protestant nationalism, the place of honor the South had in the nation is no longer possible because that nation no longer <coughs> exists. The death of Lincolnian Americanism is why the vestry Christ Church in Alexandria, Virginia, could remove not only a plaque in memory of Robert E. Lee, 
who had been a member of the church, and also a plaque to George Washington, who had been on its vestry. The church used the same cultural Marxist logic as Clinton, who approvingly imagined to the students at Portland State University, an America better off with a white minority. And that America, a statue of Washington, will be a painful reminder of the racism, sexism, classism, and homophobia of Anglo-Protestant Americanism. The vestry at Christ Church was simply preparing us today for that future cultural Marxist America. But now consider the quite different response of President Eisenhower. He kept a portrait of Robert E. Lee to the right of his desk in the Oval Office for two terms. When challenged, he explained to the nation why Lee was a great American, worthy not only of commemoration but of emulation, and why the Confederate descendants of Jefferson were as good Americans as the Union descendants of Lincoln. Eisenhower could say these things because he was addressing uh, a confident Anglo-Protestant America. This collapse of Lincolnian national identity has left a vacuum filled with a raging culture war between left and right wing Lincolnians and between both and cultural Marxist Americans. Confederate monuments stand tottering on the shaky ground of this zero-sum culture war. But neither of these warring factions are capable of providing the social trust needed for a new American national identity. Of the three, only Anglo-Protestant Americanism could do that. But its elites have lost confidence in their own culture and are besides overwhelmed by the demographic revolution. The balkanization of America will become even more pressing in the future. Americans, uh, European Americans are already a minority in Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, California. Mario Oblado, a co-founder of the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund said June 1998 in a radio program, quote, California is going to be an Hispanic state. Anyone who doesn't like it should leave. Whites should go back to Europe, end quote. So there. Despite this hateful attitude to whites, and uh, expressed by La Raza quite often, cultural Marxist President Bill Clinton awarded Oblido the Medal of Freedom. <laughs> Oblido was right. In 45 years, whites had dropped from 82% in Los Angeles County to, to 29, in, in 1860 to 29%. And most speak Spanish in that county. Only 40% speak English. Evidence that cultural Marxism is now mainstream uh, is to be found in the constant chant we hear that we are a multicultural nation and ethnic diversity is our strength. But Harvard's Robert Putnam in his book Bowling Alone argues the contrary, that a high degree of ethnic diversity degrades social trust and social capital. It causes people, he says, to shut down like turtles to distrust not only those who do not look like them, but also those who do. The region he, where he found the mo lowest degree of social trust was Los Angeles, which he describes as, quote, the most diverse, diverse human habitation in human history. In the future, we are likely to see, in a future cultural Marxist America, with a European minority uh, before 2040, we're likely to see secession and a reorganization of the peoples of the United States. The substantial Spanish communities along the borders with Mexico are already um, very closely connected to Mexico. We're likely to see Quebec, Northern Ireland, or Kosovo, Sections like that. 
Indeed, today, there are already representatives who hold a seat in the California legislature and an office in the Mexican government. And so this is, this is going to grow even more. Why must America in the future be a unitary, centralized state? And here we have the return of Jeffersonian America. Already Americans are beginning to think we should divide. It's too big. There's no social trust. The government's dysfunctional. From the Lincolnian point of view, this must be crushed because it's revolutionary. But from the Jeffersonian point of view, it's not. It's something to be thought through practically. Let me, um, let me give an example. A telling example of this spontaneous revival of Jeffersonian America is George, George Kennan, who, who is the architect of the Soviet containment policy and a faculty member at Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton, um, where he was there until 102. He argued in 1993, the United States is simply too large for the purposes of self-government, that we should begin a public debate on how to divide it into states and new federations of states. This is simply a revival of Jefferson's idea of an empire of liberty. It's just the old empire of liberty. He's saying, look, this is a part of our heritage. We just need to talk about it publicly. He's willing to take down the Berlin Wall, the invisible Berlin Wall, around the states. If America recovers the principles that animated Jefferson's empire of liberty, then by prudent divisions of the states and of the Union itself, the distinct cultures and peoples of an increasingly disunited states may live together in federative peace, if not in moral, religious, and ideological unity. This would be a true multiculturalism of the sort that actually existed from 1776 to 1861. Not the phony multiculturalism we hear, today, we hear of today, which, which makes culture trivial and which just centralizes power. Now, the Jeffersonian vision always had its eye on the human scale of political order. <coughs> Just a few more remarks. Always had its, remember that business about small. This idea of small scale gives justific moral justification to its doctrines of state nullification and secession. That's why they're morally uh, legitimate. The Jeffersonian does not require a large centralized state, and none existed prior to 1865. He favors decentralization of authority to local, state, and regional polities, and he is resolutely opposed to finance capitalism and to crony capitalism, especially on the Connell scale. Although both corruptions are bad, the evil is mitigated by small scale itself. For instance, the American states have no trouble balancing their budgets. Whereas the bloated, clumsy central government of the United States not only cannot balance a budget, it is so incompetent that it can go for years without even fixing one. <laughs> or take the little country of Iceland. It suffered the financial meltdown of 2008, as did the United States. But the Icelanders tried and jailed the culprits. <laughs> Not so in the United States. Our corrupt financial system was said to be too big to fail, and our criminals too big to jail. <laughs> but Iceland was too small to fail. You understand, too small to fail. And their criminals were just the right size to jail. <laughs> you go down the street, you grab them, and you put them in jail. Friedrich Hayek, Nobel laureate in economics, thought that liberty in the future would be best preserved in small states. He wrote, we shall not rebuild civilization on the large scale. No Berlin Wall, no Berlin Wall around the states. It is no accident that on the whole there was more beauty and decency to be found in the life of the small peoples and that among the large ones, that would be us in the United States, there was more happiness and contentment in proportion as they had avoided the deadly blight of centralization 
end quote. Jeffersonian America. Now he spoke with an Austrian accent. <laughs> but what he says here is the timeless voice of Jeffersonian America. And it was Southerners who largely created and managed that world. That's our inheritance. And we need to live up to it, and we're not. We are, some of us are recovering Lincolnians, and many have not even recovered. <laughs> but 150 years of Lincolnian indoctrination in its left and right forms, its Anglo-Protestant forms, has hidden this from us. Our task today is not primarily political. It is to recognize we are playing an entirely new game. Our task is to develop the arts of survival. To educate ourselves as to who we are, a history we've largely forgotten as Southerners, and to rediscover the Jeffersonian America that Southerners largely created. By exploring for our time the moral and intellectual possibilities and potentialities of that founding American tradition in a new form, we may not only hope to survive as a people in some new way, but learn how to flourish through what promises to be a protracted cultural war generated by the spectacular collapse of Lincolnian nationalist America. Thanks.